actually because I was home a lot more during November, uh, during December and January than I typically am home. Um, I, I think my wife is having second thoughts about this new job because uh, now she's having to become accustomed to me being around the home all the time. And uh, she had figured out uh, how to have her space. And uh, now I'm crowding her space. And it's not like I'm retiring. I mean, it's nothing, not, nothing that radical, but, uh, you know, I'm sort of in her space a little bit. Um, basically, I'll make this real short. Um, in my mid-20s, long before I thought I would, I got into denominational work. And I have basically been in denominational work since uh, the beginning of 1977. Uh, the last five years of that denominational work has been, though, as a, a person with full-time focus on consulting uh, with denominations of all kinds over North America and uh, in Europe. And I've consulted with three dozen different kinds of Protestant denominations uh, in that particular period of time. The last two years of that five years of, of focus consulting, I've done it without a denominational sponsor. I, I, I phased out of my work with uh, the South Carolina Baptist Convention over a three-year period of time. In the last two years, I've done it under the umbrella of an organization I started called New Reformation Solutions. My wife and I had always said that when our last child left home, we became empty nesters, that we would rethink uh, whether or not this was the lifestyle we wanted. And so my uh, last daughter, last child, who is a daughter, uh, went to college the first week of September. Uh, the last week of September, I came to Moncton, New Brunswick, got sick on the way here, stayed sick, but had to keep traveling for five weeks. So by the time that five weeks was over and I was well, I think either my body or the Lord or my wife or something had dealt with me enough to say, all right, I think we've made the decision about whether or not we're going to reevaluate uh, this lifestyle. And so uh, the, the Hollowfield Leadership Center at this juncture is nothing but a physical <coughs> facility that the North Carolina Southern Baptist purchased this last summer. Uh, it is located on Lake Hickory, a lake about uh, 100 kilometers north-northwest of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, lake Hickory came into being because a, a utility company called Duke Power Company built a dam and it resulted in a lake. And then Duke Power picked the prettiest peninsula on that lake, about a 21-acre uh, plot of land, and built for themselves an executive leadership center. Uh, this past summer, they sold that executive leadership center to North Carolina Baptist. And so it's already got a pretty site, pretty land, pretty buildings. It is uh, technically wired for distance learning. Uh, they've already done some simulcast reception uh, distance learning things there. We have a computer lab with uh, a couple of dozen computers in it. Uh, the first week that I'm on the job, we'll have a, a course in uh, uh, teaching churches how to build their own web pages that will be held in that place. And uh, we'll be doing all kinds of interesting and neat, uh, neat types of things there. But the job is really a compound job. Uh, somebody has to call the shots on the Hollifield Leadership Center, the physical land. And so I get the right of being the director of the physical land in the buildings, which is good news for leadership development, because typically you do leadership development and then you have to beg and borrow and steal a good facility to have it at. Well, since I direct both the Hollowfield Leadership Center and the Lake Hickory Learning Communities, I get to tell the facilities people how it must be gotten ready for the leadership events. And I, I think that's going to be a win-win. The Lake Hickory Learning Communities is basically the software to the Hollywood Leadership Center being the hardware. It is the virtual understanding of leadership development that we will be doing that will be sponsored by North Carolina Baptists but will be available to all Protestant Christians throughout the Western world. And uh, we will be doing that through a series of, uh, of virtual email uh, communities. Uh, we will offer for some of those communities to be brought together from time to time uh, at the Hollowfield Leadership Center and at other physical locations. Uh, 
the events of the, the Lake Hickory Learning Communities will not just be held at the Hollowfield Leadership Center. They'll be held in various places of, around North America. Um, we will begin our focus by focusing on the issues of uh, congregational multiplication movements will be number one. In other words, how you get a grassroots movement of church planting going that plants multiple churches simultaneously. Uh, a second thing is we're going to have a, a learning community around the issue of innovative and effective congregations. And uh, the, the, the typical thing that that means in terms of the top 15 to 20 percent of congregations, not necessarily in size, but in terms of those who know who they are, where they're headed, and how they're getting there, and seem to be using innovative and effective means to do so. Uh, the third learning community will be around the kinds of issues we've been talking about here this week. And it'll be simply called Congregational Passages. Now, one of my passions will be the fourth community, and that'll be a community focused around um, denominational futures. You know, my passion is to help denominational organizations to transform and be relevant to the congregational movements uh, in the year 2050. And so that's why I'm spending the day tomorrow with Harry Gardner and his staff to see if we can bring some relevance out of what they do to what's happening in congregations. Or let's put it this way, improve the relevance they already have uh, in, in regard to their work with congregations. That's a more benevolent way to say that, is it not? <laughs> uh, the fifth learning community will simply be called uh, a learning community on leadership communities. You've heard me talk a lot this week uh, about leadership communities and, and the focus of those and, 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 and those kinds of things. And the sixth one, I'm sitting here saying, what is the soul? I remember now. The sixth one is what's called Spiritual Strategic Journeys Learning Community, and it's talking about the whole strategic process in nonprofit, faith-based religious organizations, particularly Protestant Christian, and how that is played out. And so those are the six initial ones that, that we're getting started. Now, if indeed uh, you want to connect with one of these, you would go to the e-zine site the web address that you see here that takes two lines to do it. Eventually, it won't take two lines to do it. It's going to be a lot shorter address, but uh, we knew, again, that we were going to be moving it on the web uh, to something under the name of Hollowfield Leadership Center after the first issue. So we put up the first issue with this address. And if you go to that e-zine uh, on that website, uh, you will have hyperlinks that you can click on and connect with one or more of these learning communities. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how you get started, if you want to be a part of it. There's actually sort of a seventh dialogue group in there. The seventh dialogue group will actually be uh, relevant to what you're going to be seeing tonight. Is what's called the Book Notes Dialogue Group. And that's because I do a lot of writing of book reviews, both business books and religious books, and talk about their implications for congregational life and denominational life. And uh, so we're setting up another dialogue group that just dialogues on the latest, newest books coming out and, and other resources. Uh, that we might want to uh, pay some attention to. So that's basically it. I'll start on, on uh, Saturday. I get home on Friday. I go on payroll actually on Friday, uh, but I don't actually go to the site until Saturday. And uh, then we'll go from there. I hope to move my wife and household there by late summer. Uh, but uh, we'll start now with uh, doing some other things there. So that's everything you always wanted to know but were afraid to ask, but Bullard might tell you. Um, now, tonight, uh, you know, I just learned something about you all today before we actually get into tonight's topic. I just learned something about you all today. It's these things called annual meetings. You know, I had not heard the phrase annual meeting uttered until today. And then today I've heard it uttered innumerable times, either preceded by or followed by some expletive deleted <laughs> as people are referring to annual meetings or a moan or a groan uh, was in there somewhere. And w when I overheard people talking about their annual meetings, you know what I heard them talking about were going to be happening at these annual meetings? Accountable management issues. And, you know, it sort of occurred to me today, duh, you know, why haven't you talked about this yet, George? One of the best ways in congregations to begin to change the culture and the expectations of congregations is that when you get together for things like annual meetings, that there is an order
to how you do them. Number one, you first talk about the vision and about the sense of spiritual strategic direction. Secondly, you talk about relationship experiences and how lives are being transformed. Third, you talk about programmatic emphases and how they are empowering the transformation of lives. And then, oh, by the way, you get around to talking about the bodies, bugs, boards, and buildings. One of the most dramatic times that I had the opportunity to suggest this to some folks was uh, in a denominational organization where their board meetings were just mired down in talking about accountable management. You know, most board meetings or Baptist business meetings I've ever been to, you know, you open up the business session, you, you uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting, and then you call for the finance report. See, what you give the top priority time focus to tells me a whole lot about where you are culturally. So quite frankly, uh, if you want to change uh, the annual meetings, and I know I'm speaking heresy here, and I'm speaking directly across the bow of the Constitution and bylaws of hundreds of churches, but uh, I'm going home. And uh, <laughs> is that number one, you don't have them in the middle of the winter when there's been a lot of snow and people are emotionally slightly depressed anyhow. You have them during a warmer time of the year. Secondly, you start by celebrating answered prayer in terms of the Lord uh, helping you cast vision. Third, you then have a picnic to symbolize the relationship of each other with one another and with God. And then you sort of gather some chairs around Lounge chairs would be best. And you have a little formal session at the end that talks about programmatic emphases and accountable management pieces and does the absolutely very essential formal decision making in the life of the congregation. You see, do you get it yet? When the activities that have the most control around them our programmatic emphases and accountable management, that's what you're going to get. Weed in, bundle weed out. That's what you're going to get. What is it that you want to get out of your congregation? Now, certainly, I'm speaking with a tremendous amount of ignorance about the culture and the, the, the legality of, of the way your congregations work, but I bring that up only to say, hey, think about it. When you think about changing it, the things you can do to change the basic culture of your congregation that will make a transformational difference in your ability to serve. When the bottom line comes out at the end of a long journey, the issue is not going to matter whether or not you had the right uh, loonies and toonies accounted for in the right budget account numbers, but whether or not lives have been transformed along the journey. So what is most important to you, you ought to give the highest place of honor and energy. Mm -hmm. Just a thought for the night. You don't get anything else out of tonight. But now tonight. Tonight we want to talk about emerging postmodern perspectives on the kingdom potential of congregations. I want to acknowledge to you of all the presentations that I'm making this week, this is perhaps the one with which I'm the most uncomfortable. Uh, I was born on July 22nd, 1950. I am towards the end of the first third of the baby boomers. Uh, I tend to begin my thinking on, ju on just about every issue and tend to value above all other values left brain thinking. I like linear things. I like box systems. I like the Gospel of John as my favorite gospel. And none of those things fit in a postmodern world. And so for people like me, and there may be a few other of you in this room, 
thinking from a postmodern perspective is tough. It's a stretch. It is even uncomfortable. It seems awkward, like when the, the pro tells you to put your hand over just a little bit further when you're holding that golf club. It feels awkward, like when, when, when Clint Eastwood in Firefox movie, if any of you remember that, was stealing the, the Russian supersonic fighter and had to think in Russian in order to make the advanced systems of the jet work. You know, how do you think in postmodern when that is not your first, second, third, or fourth language? at least from your language perspective. And yet, we have a very strong postmodern society emerging in Western civilization. Not necessarily in Eastern civilization at this point, but in Western civilization. And it's going, it, it is one of those things that is sort of like uh, what lily pads do on a pond. You know, if, if, if you're at a small end of a pond around the corner from the main main part of the pond. You know the analogy that lily pads double every day. And so when you're in that small end of the pond, sort of around the corner from the main end, you know, one of the questions is if, if uh, is that you do not see the lily pads coming at you until the day before they totally fill the pond. There are changes coming around the curve at us that are, are so transformational that we don't even know how to talk about them in common ministry terms. And it is a stretch for many of us who were born before February the 9th, 1964, which is that critical change of time. The night the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show and the world changed never to go back again. Well, so when I begin to think about postmodern things, I have to have mo more tutoring myself I have certain parts of it that you're going to see that I have some extreme passion concerning. But I have to look to others. So tonight's lecture is in a way sort of a literature review. Well, not in a way. It is a literature review. It is me telling you, here is what I have learned from others who would, be, would fall in the category of advanced scouts of doing church in the postmodern mindset. The first one of these is, is Leonard Sweet. Now, if you're not familiar with Leonard Sweet, Leonard Sweet is a, just a, a, a really eclectic uh, style uh, Methodist minister uh, in the lower 48. He was at one time president of a seminary, uh, United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, and then he went to Drew University in, in, uh, in New Jersey and was dean of the School of Theology there, dean of the Benin School, and now has stepped down from the deanship and is professor of evangelism and church leadership um, at, at this particular time. But his, his latest book to be published, you see the title up here, Postmodern Pilgrims, First Century Passion for the 21st Century World. Uh, Leonard Sweet is one of the most entertaining speakers that you would ever want to hear. And he has the ability to use stories and metaphors and and and, and, and a few words to, to really point out to you some really uh, 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 powerful kinds of understandings about, uh, about the church. And so in this book, what he gives us is this word right here, the word epic, and uh, four words or phrases that it means. So one of the things that we need to understand about being postmodern pilgrims uh, uh, or being first century passion for the 21st century world, and he's talking there very directly about the church, is that we have to understand that the emerging church in the postmodern world is going to be an epic church. It's going to focus on these four things. Number one, it's going to be experiential. Now, you've heard that this week, and you know that I have a particular passion for that, and you're going to hear it more than one time tonight. It is going to focus on the experience of people. In some of the dialogue I've had with some of you all, you have raised an extremely legitimate and very valid question, and one that if it hadn't been raised this week, uh, I would say, hey, what's wrong with these folks? And here's the question. Uh, the question, well, I'm going to rephrase it, but basically what it's saying is, what's the theological context for this experiential approach to, uh, to the, this postmodern uh, kind of worship and and discipleship and activity and that kind of thing. 
Well, that is exactly the right question when you say what is the, what is the theological approach because the issue here is that we're dealing with order in which people tend to process information and not the full way that they process information. Uh, we have grown up in society, I grew up in a society, where I was taught to figure out the conceptual or theoretical framework first and lay out the strategy and then go try it out and thus have some experiences. One of the things that's going to be crucial in the postmodern world is that though postmodern mindset people are going to experience first and learn meaning later. Uh, it, is, it is the true action reflection kind of learning, which means that they're going to have to learn theology uh, as they go as opposed to learning it in, in a uh, sequential manner. You learn theology, then you go. They go, and along the way, someone needs to be flagging them about theology and flagging them about the meaning of it and, and how it fits into their life and what the context is and why what some of the things they're experiencing are, are a, 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 uh, uh, a non-Christocentric spirituality that needs to be given a, a Christocentric base. But they won't know that at first because they don't know the theology. But yet, they will revel in the experience. And so, rather than saying, you need to get out of that pit and come over here and we'll tell you what you really need to know, we've got to get in the pit with them and help them figure out what are the theological ramifications of what they're experiencing right now and how to put that in context. So the, the church of the 21st century, particularly one that has any interest at all with pre-Christians and unchurched people, are, is going to be much more experiential in its style. Secondly, it's going to be significantly more participatory. One of the things that is true, and I touched on this, I think, at the Tuesday afternoon talkback session, one of the things that uh, tends to be... Um, uh, very characteristic even of, of, of the builder generation and the boomer generation is that we can sit there and watch it happen or soak it in, you know, kind of thing. Well, in the postmodern world, it's, it's going to be participatory and you're going to be talking a whole lot about being in the midst of. You know, it's going to be interesting how some of even the theology of the kingdom of God is going to be highlighted out of the postmodern world in the sense of understanding the kingdom is in the midst. Yeah. That connects. That makes sense. So we're going to see more of that. Third, as we were hearing in the technology presentation at 11 o'clock this morning, uh, the, the postmodern world and the postmodern church is going to be more image-driven. And the, 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 the sights and the sounds, but particularly the sights, are going to be very much a part. In other words, don't give me a 30-page paper. Show me a picture or paint me a story that illustrates it. And then tell me what is the most important things that I need to know out of that story because I'm not going to dig through the theoretical background. I want to see it happening uh, because the postmodern church, again, is going to be more sensory driven using the five basic senses in order to experience Christ and to learn through that. Then finally, it's going to be connected and that's why things like virtual communities are going to be so strong. In fact, another book that I could have put in the, the literature review tonight is a very uh, almost outlandish book called Virtual Faith uh, that was written by a 29-year-old when he was a, a MDiv student uh, at uh, Harvard Divinity School, and he's now doing a Ph.D. at Boston College uh, on the... the, uh, the religion of the postmoderns. And, and one of the things he talks very strongly about is the connectedness of it all and about how the, the building of community becomes a first reality and, and that becomes initially more important than what is the content or the meaning of substance of that community. And thus, the, another illustration I gave yesterday that I want to reinforce, which is in the old paradigm of the meta-church model put forth by church growth specialist Carl George, where you would use a meta or small group model to grow a church, and where you would formally establish this whole series of small group systems, 
and get people involved in small groups around certain topics, in, in the connectedness of the postmodern mindset, you get people in community with one another, connected with one another, and then you observe the small groups that are emerging and mentor them. And you end up with postmoderns getting more people involved in meaningful small groups than if you had a sign-up sheet for small groups. They don't sign up because they're not joiners. One of the reasons why a, a lower percentage of adults, postmoderns, will actually formally join churches and be members. They are simply going to be connected at various levels with what's going on in church and are going to be eclectic enough that you're going to find that they consider themselves connected with multiple churches. They may, in the midst of that, see one of the churches as the primary church they attend, but they're going to buy, quote-unquote, certain services from more than one church in order to put together their own faith journey mixture and practice that's going on. So that's the crucial point that Leonard Sweet has to tell us about uh, what he sees as postmodern pilgrims. Number two, you have heard me refer all week to this book, Ancient Future Faith, Rethinking Evangelicalism for a Postmodern World by the, the guru of blended worship, Robert Weber. Uh, now a professor at Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, having moved from uh, Wheaton College, also in the Chicago area, uh, just this past year. Uh, Robert Weber, if you don't know this trivia, has, has an interesting background himself, uh, you know, having taught it at Wheaton College, but his actual church membership has been in an American Anglican church, an Episcopal church. And uh, his wife, his current wife, his second wife, um, is the daughter of Harold Linsell, who wrote the Battle for the Bible. So you talk about the conflict that can occur in family reunion times during the year uh, in, in, in that family, just uh, in and of itself, you know, just in the, uh, you know, Robert, don't bring it up this year, says his wife, before they go to the family gatherings, you know, or, or, or something like that. And, uh, uh, but Weber's book, I would acknowledge to you, if you're looking for a book, and you need to go to www.chapters.com and buy a book. Uh, you, you, uh, this is a book that I call a stare-out-the-window book. Because if I read it, I would stop and I'd go, hmm. And then I have to stare out the window for a while. As you think about some of the, 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 the implications of what he's saying about the church and, the, and sort of the, the, the bounding of the church uh, that is one of the byproducts that came out of the Protestant Reformation. And, and in really talking about a new sense of reformation and, and a movement uh, from being book-focused, the Bible, to being experience-focused that is a part of the postmodern scene. So what he suggests to us is that in the postmodern era, that the, these three words that I have uh, recited for you several times this week that I now want to go back and reinforce, is that the, the worship style of the, the 21st century postmodern church is going to be very much like the worship style in terms of, uh, uh, of, of a framework of the 2nd through the 7th centuries. And it will give emphasis to the concept of mystery, of symbol, and of community. And that it will take on two radical polarity forms that one of the forms will be a further heightening of what we would uh, call by various names uh, contemporary worship, uh, seeker-driven worship, which is sort of the hardcore uh, uh, style of the seeker worship, praise and worship, almost uh, the, the, the quasi-Pentecostal worship, that there will be a continued uh, uh, development of that style. But in the, on the other pole, there will be a continued development of liturgical worship, and a, a, a rediscovery of many of the, 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 the wonderful forms and, and, and the, uh, the, the richness of that, only it'll have two characteristics that have been different than how it has been characterized previously, and that is it'll be faster paced and more interactive. Faster paced and more interactive. Uh, or it'll lose the attention of the postmodern people who are there. But, you know, uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, as they say, you know, there, there, there are several uh, social phenomena in, in the Western world 
that particularly in the 20th and now in the 21st century, there are as many articles written about the phenomenons as there are people involved in them. You know, that's what they used to say about uh, uh, regentrification, which was the idea of the young urbanites moving back into the city. Uh, it was often said in, 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 in urban studies that there's been one article written about regentrification of every household that moves back into the city. Uh, or, or there's an American joke that says that, that they came across this guy uh, one day in, in, in this uh, obscure office in the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C., and he was sitting at the desk crying. And, and someone, when he finally calmed down enough to talk, asked him why he was crying. He said, my farmer died because there were as many employees in the Agriculture Department in Washington as there were farmers in, uh, in the United States at one point. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the issue is that uh, where I was coming to with all of that was uh, to say that uh, one of the things he suggests, and, and it's one of the things I would mm, give only modest amount of, uh, uh, of affirmation to, is that people who have been influenced by the New Age movement find mystery, symbol, and community as something with, that connects with the spirituality that they've been searching for. But the key difference, of course, is we stick Christ in there. And that's obviously a crucial difference and not just uh, another characteristic. The third book that I want to uh, highlight in this literature review is, is not a, a book about the church. It is a business book. It's called The Experience Economy, subtitled, Work is Theater and Every Business is a Stage. Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore are, are very interesting business writers. First of all, they are Christians. And so when you read their books, particularly this one, uh, you will find scattered all throughout the book references to the implications of what they're saying or illustrations of how this works in the church. You will even see references by one or both of them to what's going on in their specific church of membership. And so this is a book that very easily uh, carries over to understanding some things about uh, what's going on in church life. And so, as, as a matter of fact, uh, a, a leadership organization called Leadership Network that's headquartered in Dallas, Texas, uh, that uh, focuses on uh, the emerging church of the 21st century, uh, actually has held two events uh, where Jane, Jim Gilmore and or James uh, uh, or Joe Pine spoke. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, an event about the advanced scouts in, 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 of uh, the new church and the kinds of things going on. Uh, another one was they held what was called an experience event in Las Vegas, where uh, Joe Pine took a group of people around and helped them to understand how the experience that people were having in, in, in the various things that go on in Las Vegas, at least the legitimate things, uh, were, uh, were, were characteristic of how people learn and experience and had all kinds of, of church, faith, and theological implications there, too. Well, in the idea of congregational experience, congregational worship services are theater, and the full Sunday church experience is a stage. Now, the implication of that that comes out very strongly in the book is that we often, when people come to church on Sunday, only think about, let's say worship starts at 11 and ends at 12, you know, sort of a, uh, some semblance of a North American traditional time, is it, that we're only concerned about what happens between 11 and 12 in the sanctuary or worship center. What Pine and Gilmore would say to us that anything that happens to the people on the way, arriving at, in, leaving, and going home, is all a part of the experience, and that you have to look at the whole thing holistically. So that's why you have to look at things like, like parking, and greeting, and fellowship, and gathering spaces where people interact. And not just think that something so powerful it, it, it is happening in the sanctuary, in the midst of worship, 
that that's the only thing that matters. You know, like the example I was saying yesterday, what is the trek to the nursery with the children uh, of a brand new visitor to your church? That's all a part of the experience. Do they go into worship feeling like they have left their firstborn with someone who is loving, caring, and safe? I mean, that's all a part of the experience. Uh, and so that's why when you will go sometimes to theater-related experiences that part of the acting even happens in the parking lot or the gathering areas. Or when you go to a, a, a Disney World kind of thing where they truly understand the full sensory experience, uh, you have it happening all over the place. And you, and, and you always have experiences that, that are, uh, are touching multi-sensory senses that, that are going on with particular people. And so the, the piece is that, that we may be stroking the ego of our music leaders and our preachers by staying with the box idea that only what happens in the sanctuary between 11 and 12 is important. Who served best with that mindset? Think about it. Bill Eason, mild, mannered, passive Bill Eason. Now, all of that's a lie of the seven the last sentence, if any of you know Bill Eason. Bombastic, accusatory, the Bill Eason that calls 80% of all North American Protestant churches apostate, has written his newest book is Leadership on the Other Side, No Rules, Just Clues. And what Bill is talking about here is that what is really happening in, in postmodern kinds and styles and, and, and types of leadership uh, is that you are, uh, you, you, you are seeing the fact that the idea of, uh, uh, even what I brought up the other night, of, of seven characteristics of leaders or, or, or a set group of traits and other things like that, really don't matter because we don't really know what the rules are about leadership in the postmodern world. We just have some clues as to what some of the things that might occur uh, might would be. Um, here are a couple of the things that Bill says are some of the clues, and uh, some of them I've referred to this week, and, and some of them I haven't referred to this week. Um, I, I was looking for one particular one because this one this one hits at a particular point. Here's one, and it's one that I have some difficulty. I have to look out the window and think about this one, so here, this one. Leaders on the other side serve Jesus Christ in the midst of a congregation instead of serving a congregation. Now, I'll say that again for you to think about it. Leaders on the other side serve Jesus Christ in the midst of the congregation as opposed to serving the congregation. What is the authentic prophetic word that a leader has in the midst of a congregation about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and its implications for you and your eternal life. As opposed to, let me see if I can get this congregation culturally sorted together here, there, or whatever. Now there's another implication here of what he's saying. Uh, one of the things that's interesting if you look at church styles over a period of time is that at various times, uh, churches in various expressions seem to be serving more one more than the other of, of, of the Trinity. For instance, a lot of the, the praise and worship seems to have a fairly soft under, underpinning of a serving of the, the Holy Spirit. There's more of a focus on the Holy Spirit than there is on God or Jesus. Uh, sometimes some of the uh, older, longer standing traditional worship, even liturgical worship, appears to focus more on God than on Jesus and the Holy Spirit. One of the clues that Bill suggests, and he may be right, he may not be right, I'm just laying it out there for you to have to think about and respond to, is that the, in, at least in the early postmodern, part of the postmodern era, the 21st century, that the focus will be on the person of Jesus Christ as a part of the, the Trinity. 
and then you'll see more and then emerging in a, in a building focus there. Um, he suggests that, uh, that, that leaders are less constant on the other side and more consistently innovating on the fly. Uh, as they're responding to the experience that people are having. Uh, he suggests that leaders will have a greater need to be able to help others distinguish reality from fiction because one of the things that will happen in an experience-based uh, postmodern world is that people will confuse biblical, theological, Christ-centric truth from whatever experience they're having. And they will confuse general spirituality with Christianity. And so the leaders on the other side have got to be wise in their ability uh, to help people uh, understand uh, what Christ-centric spirituality looks like. One of the questions that Bill raises in his book <coughs> that I would acknowledge that is having a strong impact on me as I begin my work this weekend at the Hollisville <coughs> Leadership Center with the Lake Hickory Learning Communities is this question. If leadership is the greatest challenge of the 21st century, and if this new century is going to be radically different, what kind of leaders do we need to begin growing today so that the church can thrive in the 21st century? The core question what kind of leaders do we need to begin growing today so that the church can thrive in the 21st century? I think that becomes a critical question for me. I think that becomes a critical question for the Acadia Divinity College. I think that becomes a critical question for the United Baptist Convention of the Atlantic Province. And I think ultimately it becomes a critical question for all of us. What kind of style of of leaders are you raising up in your congregations and mentoring if the church is going to be relevant in the 21st century. And he also hits upon that recurring theme that I've talked about several times this week, that the heart of leadership in the 21st century is going to be making disciples who make disciples. That a key word for congregations and a key word for disciples uh, in the 21st century is going to be the word reproducing. Congregations who reproduce themselves through other congregations who are focused on pre-Christians and unchurched people. Which, by the way, let me stop at this point and say, <coughs> at times the question does arise, even in the United Baptist Convention of the Atlantic Provinces, and particularly in certain maybe urban areas or even rural areas, uh, do we need to be starting any more churches? And one of the answers to that question given is, no, our, our population is X, and we've got a bunch of churches. You know, there, there's hardly, uh, uh, you know, uh, enough people to go around for the churches we have. Well, the issue is, no, we don't need any more churches reaching churched people. What we need are churches reaching pre-Christians and unchurched people. And very few of our existing churches do a very good job of that. And so we need new churches with a different kind of DNA, of not a reshuffling of existing people. And I'll, I'll, I'll stray a little bit further with this rabbit that I'm chasing and say that when I went to South Carolina for our National Missions Agency uh, in 1985, one of the reasons I was asked to come there as head of our overall missions work was my track record in strategizing for and starting new churches. That wasn't the only reason, but that was one of the top three reasons. And they asked me to look around and suggest a, a prophetic and a challenging strategy. I looked around at the state of South Carolina. At that time, there were approximately uh, 3.6 million people in South Carolina. And from all the research that had been done by all the groups that researched this kind of thing, approximately 50 to 51 percent of those people were churched in some kind of Protestant or Roman Catholic church situation. You know, pretty broad definition there. And uh, so that meant that 1.8 million of people were either pre-Christian or unchurched. 
There were also, in the state of South Carolina, 1,700 Southern Baptist churches. And I suggested that what we needed to do was to start 500 additional Southern Baptist churches over the next 15 years. To which most of the people looked at me and said, you're crazy. I said, no, the issue is we don't, want, we don't need to start any congregations like we have to reshuffle existing church people. We need to start congregations to reach pre-Christians and unchurched people. And if we successfully over the next 15 years start 500 new congregations and each of them grow to the average total membership over their lifetime of the average Southern Baptist Church in South Carolina, which is 300, then we will have reached 150,000 of the 1.8 million lost people. That will leave the other 1,650,000 for the already existing churches. I don't think we're going to bump into each other. Let me tell you the rest of the story. Over the next 15 years, which meant through December 31, 2000, the end result is over 500 new congregations were started in South Carolina during that period of time. And if you do a line graph of the new congregations and a line graph of the congregations that existed 15 years ago, and group them together in those two groups, the congregations that were already in existence 15 years ago have declined as a group. All the new growth and more has come out of the 500 new churches started. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I was in the middle of something else, and boy, I have long since forgot uh, where I was on that, but we'll go forward. Bill Eason suggests that there are uh, some clues to the wormhole, and that's uh, part of what I've been telling you now, are some of these clues to the wormhole. But he also what he offers what he calls eight mega clues for the local church. Uh, one of the mega clues that he offers for the, the, for the local church that, uh, well, here are, here are three of them. The sharpest contrast between thriving and dying churches continues to be A, a commitment to Jesus Christ, B, an indigenous style of ministry, and C, empowering lay ministries. I'll go over that again. The sharpest contrast between thriving and dying churches continues to be A, their commitment to Jesus Christ, the depth and the passion of that, B, the indigenous styles of worship either being utilized or not being utilized, and C, empowering lay ministries. Whether or not your lay ministries are permission-giving or, no, you all don't need to worry about that. Me and the staff will handle it. Now, which is the style? Secondly, among the mega clues, high-commitment churches will have a better chance of reaching non-believers than low commitment churches. In other words, churches who require things of their members. Churches who take church membership seriously. Many of you would be aware of a book that came out approximately 30 years ago, written by a man in the States by the name of Dean Kelly, uh, and it was given the title by the publisher to the protest of Dean Kelly, the author, of why conservative churches are growing. Many of the an analyses of that book over the years have realized that the true point of the book was the point that the author would tell you in private was what he really meant there. What he really meant was why high commitment churches are growing and low commitment churches are not. Now it happens that a much larger percent of high commitment churches also tend to be conservative within the spectrum of Protestantism. And a much lower percentage of churches who are high commitment tend to be liberal in the spectrum of Protestantism. But it is the issue of churches who re require accountability of one another and who expect people to be growing in their faith and practicing their faith and being on, on, on missional journeys with one another. 
Well, I give you this third flu, and then I see by the, the, the watch on the wrist that uh, we, I'm having too much fun with, uh, with, with this literature review. The third one is church planting will be a primary mission of thriving local church and denominational systems. Church planting will be a primary mission for thriving local church and denominational systems. Um, there are some mega clues for the church at large. Uh, I, I'll speak to one of them because the other two I've spoken to in various ways this week. One of them is cyber churches will become some of the largest churches and may be the new form of the mega church. Cyber churches will become some of the largest churches and may be the new form of the mega church. Well, the final book in this literature review is a book by a, a, a Danish man by the name of Rolf Jensen. It is called The Dream Society. How the coming shift from information to imagination will transform your business. Now, Rolf Jensen makes uh, no claim to be Christian. I read the book not because I was trying to find out what a Christian would say, but I was trying to find out what a futurist was saying about societal trends. And we have talked often about the fact that the, uh, um, the 20th, the last half, last third, last quarter, whatever part you want to give it credit for, of the 20th century has indeed been the information age. Some have suggested that the, the 21st century is going to be the digital age. Uh, Roth Jensen is not alone in the voice of saying, no, uh, the, re the reaction or the response to the high-tech information age is not going to be another high-tech age known as the digital age, although that's going to be driving a lot of stuff under the hood. It is going to be the dream age or the imaginative age. And people are going to dream bigger dreams. Young men will dream many dreams. Young women will dream many dreams. The church in the dream society will. The church will play a crucial role in the dream society as it relates to two questions. And the, the thing that is interesting is Rob Jensen has no uh, apparent uh, faith commitment that I was able to discover in any of the background reading or anything like this. But he has a whole section in the book where he talks about the importance of the church in the dream society. And uh, he, he thinks, from his non-theologian viewpoint, from his just being a futurist, and we'd have to call him a secular futurist, that the two most important questions that the church will have to continually answer are, why were we put on earth, and what happens when we die? You know, real crucial questions that the secular woman and man is indeed asking of the earth's parent. But the most powerful thing that comes out of this book that, that I'm using in my strategic work, and I will be talking with the, uh, the convention staff in our all-day workshop tomorrow, is the issue of telling the future story of your church. One of the most fun, and you know, you've got to have fun in whatever your work is. In, 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 in the, uh, all the travel I do and stuff like that, the travel is not the fun. The fun is what old Hannibal used to say on the TV show, The A-Team. Boy, isn't it great when a plan comes together. And, and when a plan comes together, some of the most exciting plans that have come together in the last couple of years is, if, is I've had, as I've tried to begin to work with congregations and denominations to tell their future story, where I will work with them and say, let's pretend that it is, and, and let's say this, this is February, what is it, the 14th? Oh, yeah, Valentine's Day. Did y'all all remember that? Uh, it's February the 14th, 2001. What if it was February 14th, 2012? Tell me the story of your church. What have you become? And then I've worked with them through a process of trying to write different scenarios and then write the story. And then I say, okay, if this is the future story of your church, now tell me what apparently has been the vision that your church has been seeking to fulfill over the last 12 years. Hit the wrong button and you go.
go everywhere. And, uh, you know, it is amazing as a backdoor entrance to vision how many people all of a sudden light bulbs go on and they say, whoa, now I understand vision. Now I understand how to get at it. The future storytelling is going to focus a lot, I would like to suggest, on the Gospel of Luke, which is in many ways the storytelling gospel. A, a strong emphasis on the parables. Uh, a lot of discussion of the signs and the wonders were given us there in that particular place. But you may not have the same strong belief that I have about uh, the emerging postmodern society. That's all right. I didn't present this literature review tonight for you to agree with everything I've said or to agree with everything I'm suggesting to you that these authors have said. I am suggesting to you that I am in agreement with the fact that we have, are, have been about the process of coming through a huge hinge point in Western society. And those that, that, that seem to have some understanding of it feel like in coming out the other end, we're coming out into what can only be called on this side a postmodern society. Maybe once we fully get into it, we'll have a be much better name to call it rather than to say it's after the modern society. That, that that is over. But if that is true, and I believe there is a lot of truth contained in it, then there are a lot of paradigm shifts coming. And you know when a paradigm shifts, you go back to zero. And you have to rethink how you do things. Does that mean, George, that we throw out everything the way we everything we did during the modern era? Oh, absolutely not. But it may definitely have to be approached differently and reconceptualized. But in the true spirit of postmodernism, we at least throw it up for new consideration. Knowing, because one of the things that happens in any culture, it happens, we talked about all week, it happens in church culture, it happens in denominational cultures, it happens in seminary cultures is that over the years, we take the core things that are really crucial and important and put all kinds of cultural trappings around them. When a paradigm shifts, you are forced to go back to find the core. Now, in the new paradigm, you'll put all kinds of cultural trappings on them. <laughs> but you're forced to go back and say once again, wait a minute, this is the core. And this was culture. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>